Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Over the past few months, we've been working hard to craft an agenda for TwimbleCon AI platforms that's both practical and interactive. And I encourage you to check out what we've pulled together over at TwimbleCon.com if you haven't recently. But TwimbleCon's about more than great content. It's also about community. And in that vein, we'll be creating numerous opportunities for attendees to engage with one another and the broader Twimmel universe. One of the things I am most excited about is that at TwimbleCon, we'll be joined by a bunch of formal Twimble podcast guests. This esteemed group will be there to take in all that TwimbleCon has to offer, including the opportunity to learn from and share their experiences with the entire AI platforms community. We'll be hosting an unconference at TwimbleCon as well. This is a community-driven segment of the event where attendees will have the opportunity to propose and vote on topics that they want to further explore in small group discussions and presentations. Finally, after kicking off the first day with great keynote interviews and breakout sessions, we wanted to make sure that attendees have the opportunity to unwind and connect. Plus, we also wanted an excuse to celebrate our first conference, third birthday, and 300th episode of the podcast. So we'll be concluding day one with a TwimbleCon happy hour party. Of course, there will be food and drinks, but also fun activities like an AWS Deep Racer contest, a Twimmel interview booth and photo booth, a DJ, and more. You definitely don't want to miss out. There's still time to register at TwimmelCon.com, which takes place on October 1st and 2nd in San Francisco. Hit pause now and head over to twimblecon.com slash register to secure your spot. We'll wait for you. Great. Now that you're all registered and ready to go, please enjoy today's show. All right, everyone. I am on the line with Greg Wilcox. Greg is director of R&D at Unanimous AI. Greg, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So before we started this call, I went over to your LinkedIn and saw that you did your, I think, undergrad and grad work at Wash U in St. Louis, which uh, I'm in St. Louis recording this as we speak. Oh, uh, no and way. based here in St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, so maybe tell us a little bit about your, your background and kind of how you got started in uh, AI. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I got started, I was doing uh, my bachelor's in systems engineering and physics at WashU, um, and I was really enjoying it. Um, and I had the opportunity to do my master's there as well, and I wanted to get into robotics. Um, robotics had always interested me. Um, I had done some electrical engineering, and my dad's an electrical engineer. Um, and I got thinking and um, started like doing some research into artificial intelligence as a result. A lot of robotics research is focused around machine learning um, and obviously artificial intelligence. So um, through that process, I took a couple of machine learning courses, got more and more interested, and obviously started hearing about things like um, like deep learning um, and AlphaGo and stuff like that. Um, obviously just super motivating results that I think a lot of students these days are noticing and taking note of and um, really motivating them to get started in AI research. So I followed that same path. Um, and got my master's in robotics from WashU, and then, yeah, and then joined Unanimous. Tell us a little bit about what Unanimous is up to. I, I'm looking at this paper that you wrote with the uh, uh, CEO and founder of the company, Louis Rosenberg, on artificial swarm intelligence. Uh, what is that, and what are you um, trying to do at the company? Yeah, absolutely. So most AI companies take the approach that we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to automate human processes, right? To do things that are easy or hard to do, but that are fairly automatable, such as um, making predictions or um, learning about the world and making decisions as a result of that. Um, at Unanimous, we treat humans a little differently, right? Rather than data label, rather than as data labelers, we think that humans are really, really fundamentally very smart and have knowledge and wisdom about the world. Um, that state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms just don't have access to. Um, and so by, tr by thinking about humans in this way, by thinking about them as really, really 
um, smart, um, we can actually use them as data processors rather than data points. So when you're, as one example, when you're um, on surfing Google, Google's tracking your clicks, they're treating your behaviors as just a data point um, and trying to learn like market using machine learning algorithms to market to you um, based on your data points that you leave behind. Um, we do things very differently. Um, we connect people using AI algorithms and allow them to think together as a group. Um, so what we like, we've devised this swarm AI algorithm that's based off of algorithms in nature that allow human groups to make more optimal forecasts, decisions, or prioritizations. Um, and it's all really based on this idea in nature that organisms are better collectively thinking than thinking alone. And some examples of that um, are bees, fish, schools of fish, flocks of birds. All of these natural organisms have developed systems that allow themselves to think together more accurately than individuals. Um, so a bee, when trying to, a bee colony, when trying to think about, well, where should we position our hive next year? A single bee just can't make that decision. If like they're just not um, intelligent enough, they have a brain the size of like a grain of rice. Um, and so they can't think of, oh, there are 17 different locations and let's weigh those on different factors, including the height from the ground, the, um, the size of the hive itself, et cetera, et cetera. So the individuals are not smart enough to make this decision accurately. Um, and so what they do is they, they form this real time system. They actually, um, an emergent intelligence in for, uh, forms because the, the group thinks together as a whole. Um, and the way they do that is by communicating. They uh, form a swarm intelligence by um, almost debating the answers in real time. I don't uh, know if you're familiar with a, a waggle dance, but essentially they are dancing to express their, um, their conviction in a certain site. Um, yeah, so bees do this in one way, fish do it another way, um, birds do it in a different way. But really what we see is that these real time systems of um, independent thinkers and decision makers, the real time systems as a whole form a smarter super intelligence, a hive mind um, that is smarter than the individuals um, in the group. And so um, we based our technology off that phenomenon um, called swarm intelligence. Um, and all we do is because humans haven't evolved that method themselves of forming swarms, we've created an artificial swarm intelligence, which is really connecting humans with an AI algorithm so that the humans can become a, an, uh, a hive mind. Um, they can group together into a hive mind that is more accurate as a whole than any individual as a group or than the group as just as if they were taking a vote. I don't think anyone would argue your kind of base premises that humans are smart and that uh, they communicate and when they communicate, they can make each other smarter or make better decisions, things like that. Uh, beyond that, though, the the notion of kind of this confluence of swarm and, and AI is still abstract. Like, how, how can we make that more concrete? Sure. Um, so you can think of um, language as one form of swarming. Um, so you can think that when we're communicating, everyone is thinking together as a group. Let's say we're a group of five people trying to make a decision. We would start talking and coming up with the best answer. Um, so that's a form of swarming. The problem is the loudest, like it's basically a focus group or a, a debate. The loudest person in the room exerts the most influence. Um, the, the, our biases come into play. So age, ethnicity, the background of a human, um, determines how you judge that human. Um, and so realistically, that's not an effective form of decision making. The group's insights are not um, aggregated in a good way. Um, so what we've done is we've designed a graphical interface, an online interface in which all participants are anonymous. Um, and this interface is um, contains a puck and everyone has a magnet that they can pull on a puck on the puck. And so um, in an anonymous way and in a very democratic way where everyone's exerting influence in real time synchronously, um, we can reach optimal decisions collectively together. Um, so it's a, it's an anonymous democratic form of communication. Uh, so we've, we've got a decision that needs to be made. Uh, where should we build our hive? We've all got, uh, say there are half a dozen options and we've all got access to some magnets where we can pull this puck. Um, it sounds like 
you're it's kind of a sophisticated voting scheme in some way sure yeah you can consider it um it it's real-time voting but where the consensus is being represented um on the screen um and so yeah it's yeah it's similar to that and so where does ai come into play so what we're really doing with the AI is moderating the discussion. Um, the, the puck is sort of a representation of the consensus of the swarm. And so as that approaches a target, the, the swarm is choosing that um, one. As, as, if the, as the puck approaches an answer, the swarm is choosing that answer. So where the AI really comes into play is moderating um, the strength of each user. So as we um, as we notice one user is more convicted than another or really, really has a strong belief in one of the answers, they'll get more strength and more weight into the um, decision or forecast. Um, and so we, we've designed a number of AI algorithms that using this graphical interface um, sort of measure users' conviction. For example, if they're switching between multiple answers, they're probably less convicted, they have less um, strength of belief than someone who is pulling for the same answer in the whole swarm, right? Someone that's really entrenched and really, really wants one answer is more convicted than someone who's wishy-washy. So we have some algorithms that measure conviction in that way. Um, another one is that you really have to be close to this puck with your magnet. The closer your magnet, the more force you have. The problem is the puck's moving. And so you have to be really thinking and really putting effort into controlling your, the location of your magnet, really trying to pull as hard as you can at all times. And that dynamic system, really, we've like we've shown that it is very useful in finding the conviction of a user. Users that are more convicted will put more effort and mentally into um, trying to exert their will on the puck. And so when we're talking about moving this puck, are we talking about like with a video game controller or like slamming down on the, the down arrow keys or? Just using your mouse. Or using your mouse, so you're you're physically doing some action. So this is kind of like a real time voting thing where you've got. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of this video game that I'm thinking about, where you have like multiple players and you end up like it has one of these trackballs, and you just end up slamming this trackball as hard as you can to try to move whatever it is in your direction. Like that's the picture that's that's forming for me. Yeah. So it's it's. I think rather than slamming a trackball, it's pretty calm and it's pretty fun. Users really enjoy using the system, I think. Um, yeah, but I think it is like a very engaging experience where people really are like are um, feel a sense of emotion when the swarm is not going their way. And they're really forced to think about the options at play and how they can reach an answer that's good for them, even if it's not their best answer. And so it's about this game of compromise. A game is maybe a good word for it. Um, where we're thinking about compromise and um, entrenchment um, and all these human factors. So it really, at the end of the day, comes back to humans and um, mm -hmm. emotions. So you me you mentioned compromise, uh, and previously you mentioned that the part of the dynamic of this game or system is that the more convicted uh, user you know, gets more strength and has more greater ability to influence the the outcome you know, if the political climate is the is any indication you know strength of conviction isn't necessarily uh tied to you know judgment or you know willingness to compromise how does that play out in this environment mm -hmm. yeah so well strength of conviction isn't always correlated to accuracy in general we find that it is specifically when there's a when we're forecasting so um, if we're like trying to forecast the outcome of a sports game, um, generally we find that um, the strength of someone's conviction is correlated to their accuracy. People who don't know what they're talking about are more likely to switch than people who do know what they're talking about. Um, while that in, in certain cases is not true, um, as, a, as a general rule, we find it to be the case. And you mentioned sports. Maybe that's a good segue to talking about some uh, use cases that will help make this even more concrete. Um, it sounds like you're doing some work in the sports arena. Absolutely. Yeah. So every week we predict a number of sports, um, the five uh, main sports in the U.S., um, NHL, NBA, MLB, um, NFL, and EPL, English Premier League. Um, we've done like some really, really interesting research that shows that 
swarms are very, very accurate at forecasting sports. Um, and so um, we're predicting March Madness this year. Um, and actually last year, maybe a good, a good point of conversation is that we went up against ESPN. Um, and ESPN has this bracket. Um, anyone can make a bracket on ESPN and 17 million people did last year. Um, what's crazy about that is that we got a group of 50 people to forecast this bracket as well. That's a full 63 games. Um, in the, and that's really, you have to forecast the first round, then based on your picked winners from the first round, go to the second round. Um, and so forecasting these 63 games, um, we find that the 17 million people, if you calculate their average, they would have performed in the 50th percentile. But when making a decision as a, when making a forecast as a swarm, we can um, increase the forecasting accuracy of just 50 regular fans all the way up to the 92nd percentile. So really, we're aggregating the wisdom and the insights of participants to make more accurate forecasts. Uh, the point of conversation normally comes up, well, what happens if you're just taking a vote of that 17 million people, right? That's a huge base of knowledge and wisdom. Um, how well would they have done? Well, we find that if the ESPN has a people's bracket, which is a, like basically a wisdom of the crowd and an average of the most people's brackets. So if you had taken a vote, the people's bracket is what you would have received. And that only scored in the 60th percentile. So we get an extra 32% um, improvement upon that by aggregating knowledge and wisdom in a real time swarming system um, rather than just taking a vote. And so the the 50 people that participate in this, were they somehow randomly chosen from the 17 million or is there a, a relationship between them? Yeah, they weren't. They were sampled from a similar population, right? They just self-identified as enthusiasts. They were not experts. They weren't um, like paid to participate or compensated for their accuracy. They were just regular NBA fans who signed up via a newsletter and wanted to um, forecast these games and see what the swarm would have predicted. And so predicting, trying to predict the outcome of sports games is one application. Uh, what are some others? Sure. So what's really powerful about this technology is that it's, it's usable across really any domain. Any question that a human can answer, a group of humans can also answer. So Swarm, therefore, can also answer. Um, so we see applications of this from sports is one example, but medical is another. We did a study with Stanford that showed we can reduce the diagnostic error of doctors um, by 33% when diagnosing pneumonia. Um, we can amplify the accuracy of um, financial traders by um, 26% when thinking together as a swarm. Um, so like medicine, finance, business decision making is another um, where we're thinking about making business forecasts or prioritizations or um, really decisions in a swarm. And we've shown that that's also significantly more accurate. So really the, the applications for this technology are vast. Um, and so, yeah, we're really at the moment hoping to bring that to more and more people. Okay. So I'm, I'm getting kind of a, my, my picture of, of what you're doing continues to refine. I guess my current uh, soundbite maybe would be that it's kind of like a real-time, nonverbal collaboration tool, in a sense, where you're collaborating over or voting tool, where you're like collaborating or voting on kind of simple questions as opposed to projects or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think collaboration is absolutely the way to think about this because we're not just taking a simple vote. We're asking people to behave. Like, right. And the behaviors here are the really, really important part. Yeah, this maybe goes back to this idea of conviction, but do you find that, is there some dynamic where a person's participation in this, is it again, like slamming the trackball as hard as you can or moving the mouse as hard as you can, or just kind of, in other words, um, you know, as vigorously as you desire, uh, tr you know, trying to impose your conviction on the other participants, or is there some kind of dynamic nature where, you know, people you you've demonstrated that people see what other people are uh, are also convicted about and kind of change their the way they express themselves. So we find that people are very sort of empathetic when using the system. 
um, they're more easily able to consider other people's viewpoints. And so they're, instead of the idea of slam, like slamming a trackball, um, really trying to impose your will on other people, um, when using the system, you only have, let's say there are 40 people in the system, you have one fortieth of the like of of the control, right? So you really are not in complete control. It's the it's the will of the hive mind, if you will, that determines the decisions or forecasts or outputs of the system. And so really, um, you are just a, a small part of a larger tool of a larger system. And so you need to work with the system by thinking, how could I best direct this towards what I would like, um, rather than trying to exert your will on the system and make other people believe you. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's kind of the the question that I'm trying to ask, you know, and the one end there's just, you know, say that there are, you know, six possible responses, um, you know, the one then there's like a one dimensional input where I'm just pressing CCC or, you know, trying to direct somehow this puck to C. But it sounds like you're describing a world in which it's almost like a strategy game in the small where I'm trying to exert influence indirectly. Um, but it's not clear to me how that plays out in the scenarios we've talked about. Sure. Yeah. So let's imagine um, let's imagine that there are three options um, and they're equally spaced and what we're like, let's say that um, 30% of people are pulling towards answer one and 70% of people are pulling towards answer two. And let's say I'm pulling towards answer three. So as the swarm is evolving, the puck is moving towards answer two because most people um, are pulling towards that outcome. But if I really don't like answer two, I could oppose it. I could pull against it rather than pulling for something, right? Or I could switch to answer one. Really, what I'm what I'm engaging in is this behavior that is really, really complex. It's like a game um, in which I'm deciding how do I want to try to influence the swarm. Um, and so, concretely, this could be if we're talking about a puck moving around a decision space on a screen, I could just be pulling directly against an answer that I don't want, or I could be switching and pulling for an answer I do want. Um, in real time, everyone's making these decisions. Everyone's thinking together and behaving together. Um, and so it's, um, it's, it forms a very complex system where, um, the, there are an infinite number of ways to reach an answer, but the way that I behave is going to be, um, reflective of my beliefs on that question. If I am pulling against an answer, I'm showing, I really don't want that answer. If I'm pulling, if I switch from one answer to another, I'm saying, well, I value this answer, but if forced to choose a different answer, I would choose this one. Um, this other answer. So, yeah, I, I think you're on the spot on that. It is really a like a, a decision space where people are trying to come to um, come to an answer that's not necessarily their first choice. We're talking because there's AI involved in this. Let's maybe dig into where exactly you're using AI and what types of uh, AI are at play here. So um, our, our research and AI focus mainly on three components, right? Um, we are studying what happens before a swarm. How do we select the right participants to join a swarm? So a swarm of experts, we like can really only amplify intelligence. And so if people are flipping coins and they have no idea, we can't amplify that. So we have to find experts, people who know enough about a question, experts or enthusiasts, um, in order to amplify intelligence. And so finding the right people is really important and finding enough of them is really important. Swarms are more accurate with more people. Um, so that's the first stage, finding the right people for a swarm. Then our AI system um, in the, in the, during the swarm phase is really, really important. This is the phase where we're weighting people's contributions to the swarm when they're swarming. Um, really engaging in deliberation and de uh, devising the algorithms that constitute that deliberation. So that's like, who has the most conviction? What is the right way to ask questions in order to get really accurate intelligence out? So that's a level of um, real-time AI that we've devised and we continue to iterate upon and make more and more accurate. And then the final stage that we focus on researching is um, post-processing. And so Post-processing can take any number of forms from visualization of the deliberation, like why did the swarm choose this? How did they reach this answer? Um, to 
um, more complex machine learning, which is what is the probability that they're um, that this answer is correct? One of the really interesting projects that we did over the past couple um, months was uh, training a conviction network. So this is a, a behavioral neural network that looks at the aggregate behaviors of all of these individuals in the swarm um, and tries to say, it, what is the probability in abstract terms that the swarm was correct? So to make this more concrete, let's take an example. Um, let's say we're predicting hockey, NHL, um, and the swarm is considering will team A or team B win, right? So um, as the swarm behaves, you'll see people pulling for team A high confidence, team A low confidence. They're really um, expressing different levels of conviction in the right answer. We can train, we've trained a machine learning algorithm to, to predict the probability that that pick will be correct. So if they choose the Knights to win a game, we may be able to say not only, oh, we think the Knights will win, but they'll win with a 64% probability. Now that that's really, really interesting because it's a level deeper, it's a level more precise than what the swarm is giving. We're really using these complex behaviors, the acquiescence, the, the entrenchment of users to get an understanding of what is the, what is the real world probability of this event. Um, and so with this model, with this um, probabilistic forecast, which we call conviction, um, we're able to significantly amplify the precision of swarms. Um, one specific example of that um, was NBA last year. So we predicted 238 games over 25 weeks um, at, in NBA, so team A or team B who will win. Um, and we find that as a baseline, the swarm returned to 25% ROI. So betting on the swarm's picks you would have made 25% of uh, return on investment. That means if you bet $100 at the start of the season and bet evenly across all of the Swarm's picks, by the end of the season, you would have $125, um, which is pretty impressive result. And we find um, statistically significant result that the Swarm outperformed the large scale Vegas application. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we apply this machine learning model conviction to select the games that we think are more probable than Vegas suggests, like when we really devise a precise forecast and then bet based on that forecast, we can increase this um, ROI significantly to 52%. So really there's this, there's like, that's a very, very interesting result to us because it means that the behaviors in swarms are more interesting and more important than the, than the, um, just the raw result itself, right? It's, it's how people interact with one another, how they weigh their levels of conviction and how they behave. That, um, is the, is the really the, the primary functionality of the swarm. It's why this is so that, that that's the reason this is so accurate. It sounds a little bit like the kind of the, the mythical perpetual money machine. Um, and whenever I hear that, I wonder like, why are you bothering trying to sell software or whatever you're doing and not just like playing your own bank? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's partly because this is a really experimental technology, you know, <laughs> this is also a very recent result. We published this conviction result recently. And so we're just starting to like we are, we are always surprised by the accuracy of this technology, um, and so it is a. Um, we're still growing our levels of confidence in this. Really, we're still experimenting and analyzing post humorously these results. Sports forecasting and financial forecasting is definitely on our roadmap for the future, um, but it's we are a small team, and it's going to take a little bit more time before we're um, ready to put company money on that. Although I can share that our internal team is. Um, betting small amounts with our own money, um, just as a, like as an office pool, you know, like just, just for fun. But before we're like, we're not ready to go. Kind of the um, unanimous version of dog fooding. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Puppy chow is something we engage in regularly. Uh, so the, this conviction network, um, maybe talk a little bit about the, uh, the inputs to this network, the, the architecture or structure of the network, you know, anything unique about, how it's trained, that kind of th stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really it's a neural network that's training on the behaviors of swarms. Um, so what I mean by that is it's looking at aggregate statistics, like how long a swarm took to reach an answer, how much support there was for each answer, um, and the changes in that support over time. Um, and it uses these features, this um, set of features to like 
and trains on the outcome of the games. So if the swarm reaches an answer very quickly with high support for a single team, that's a very high conviction answer. And it's going to give a high probability that the swarm gets that answer correct. And historically, we've seen that high support for an answer and short time to reach that answer is associated with a very accurate forecast. So it's a it's a standard machine learning program, um, like inputs as behaviors, outputs as probability, trained on a binary representation of was this game correct? Wins and losses. This, yeah, wins and losses, exactly. Um, with, with the special sauce really being the behaviors of individuals in the swarm, right? The special the special component of this is the data that we have access to as part of treating humans as data processors rather than data points. Mm -hmm. So the inputs are essentially kind of meta features of the swarm itself. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, And so the, we were kind of digging into, you know, the various places that machine learning expresses itself in the platform. Um, the conviction network, is, you, you kind of went through these three, finding the right people, waiting for their contributions and post-processing. And then it sounds like the conviction network is, is a separate uh, thing, if I'm understanding that correctly. Um, yeah. Maybe let's kind of dig into a little bit the, you know, those first three, finding the right people, like how, where does machine learning come in there? Um, well, we can start there. Sure. Yeah. So conviction is like a, a one part of the post-processing in the pre-processing section. Um, we want actually my first project with unanimous was um, as, as like a master's project in my program was to identify the right users, right? So let's say we get a number of um, surveys every week, every, every week before our sports swarms, we do a survey and we say, who do you think will win team A or team B for each of the games that we're predicting? Um, obviously over time we find that some users are better than others. Um, and so part of our statistics and machine learning efforts focus on how do we identify the right, like users that will perform well. Um, one way to do that is by saying, okay, what's your historical accuracy? And we can use a Bayesian framework for that, or we can use like, um, other statistical frameworks to say, what is your average accuracy over time? And we can use those users. Or we could look a little deeper into the data that we're collecting um, and say, for a specific survey, what is the probability that you are like a good user? How, how well are you expected to perform relative to average? Um, we've made some really interesting strides in that space as well by treating humans as, like again, as, um, as data processors rather than data points. Um, and so like to give an example of one of the ways we're doing that, um, we designed recently a dynamic survey um, that uses a novel nonlinear scale um, to make humans really think about to weigh their risk and reward, right? To say, um, so they are essentially wagering on games, um, but the more that they wager on one team, they the amount that they win if the other team um, is actually wins and is successful decreases even more. And so there's this nonlinear um, dichotomy that they have to think about and be faced with in order to make the, a decision. And so um, we found that this this method of wagering, which um, if you go on our blog and um, take one of these sports predictions, you actually be directed to this this novel scale. Um, we found that this method of asking people to behave in a survey um, allows us to identify the good versus the bad performers on a specific week more accurately. So more than just saying, oh, you've performed well in the past, um, we have methods that allow us to identify, oh, on the specific week, are you likely to perform well? Uh, You know, say going back to kind of our predicting sports games, it strikes me that one of the keys would be figuring out the right representation or features for the games themselves. Like how do you what makes a, a given, you know, are we talking about even um, the right people for hockey versus basketball? And I guess, you know, we can just label those as hockey and basketball. But if we're talking about a specific basketball game, are we, you know, is it kind of a naive thing? Well, this person, you know, bets correctly with regards to this team or, you know, I guess how rich is the the feature space for that you're looking at for games or, you know, any of these things that you're trying to optimize the people choices around. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So the data set is getting richer as we collect more data. Um, what, what I think you're moving towards is um, can we weight the contributions of individuals um, for specific games? So if we notice that one of like this one user, let's call them user A, is great at predicting the outcome of Knights games, maybe because they're a Knights fan, um, but really terrible at predicting Raptor games. Um, or like, so those are two hockey teams. So they're great at predicting one hockey team, but really bad at predicting another hockey team, like because they are fans of one team and maybe don't know anything about the other team. Um, it's like, so could we weight that user in the swarm highly on one question, give that sort of an expert level on one question and give them a novice level on another question, um, which is um, sort of, yes, we can. Um, but we find that generally um, we want to find we want to curate a diverse population, so in order to make the most accurate predictions. And so the factors that I would highlight as being the most key to accurate swarm forecasting are the average level of knowledge of participants, the average the size of the group is the two primary factors, and then the third is the diversity of beliefs. So. The more or the diversity of information sources and what i would say by that is if everyone is um, answering questions from the same news source so if everyone's getting their news from fox news or something and there's no diversity no one's getting from cnn or bbc or al jazeera um, then they're all going to have the same belief and they're they may all be right or they may all be wrong what swarms are really good at is aggregating from really diverse information sets really diverse sources. And so if we have one Knights fan and one Raptors fan, that's probably going to be um, better than just having um, all really accurate Knights fans in a, a group. So we've talked about post-processing and pre-processing. Um, what are what are kind of the underlying mechanisms of the weighting component? So the, the, the most important... So, in the like in during the swarm and the optimization of the swarm, which is the almost central component to our technology, um, the most important thing are these algorithms that we've discussed around um, around how do we allow groups to deliberate? How do we um, engage them in a real time system? So the real time component of this algorithm is really the most important. Um, but then second to that is how do we um, allow them to see each other's beliefs? Um, and how do we aggregate those beliefs? And so those are really systems level components um, and that I think are the most important. And so uh, is machine learning a component in doing those system level things or are they, is it more deterministic in, in some way or? Yeah, so we use machine learning to understand what makes an accurate swarm. We use data science to do that as well as we are develop and as we become more complex as a company um, we may be able to use machine learning within the algorithm itself at the moment what we've has gotten us to this point though has been just allowing uh, just having static algorithms so algorithms that uh, there's a list of i think 30 algorithms that determine how the swarm evolves right determines the weight of individuals that determines um, the location of the puck um, all of these different factors. And while we use data science and machine learning to optimize those factors, we don't, um, we don't use machine learning in the process of a swarm. And so, uh, so we've talked about kind of sports betting as one uh, area of use for this. You're building this for some customer, or maybe you're building it ultimately to, you know, build a perpetual money machine and just, you know, get rich with compounding uh, winnings. Uh, but you know, perhaps there, you know, is there a customer that you've got in mind for this? And if so, you know, who is that customer? Uh, is it, you know, the sports world or is that a kind of a demonstration? Is there some, some other kind of customer who do you, sure. who do you think needs this? Yeah. So I think it was Einstein that said compounding interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Um, but that's not really our goal here. Our goal is to make humans smarter it's to keep humans relevant in a time where ai is becoming like very dominant or very powerful um, this system follows 
like by by being based off of humans, it has human ethics, human morals, um, and it's able to make decisions that AI I don't believe should, right? Because it 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 keeps humans in the loop. Um, as a result of that, what we're really targeting with this platform um, is is like allowing human teams to access this tool. And so one of the exciting like news announcements that we have is that um, in the next two weeks we'll be opening the system up, this platform up for um, beta customers. So any business team that wants to amplify their accuracy of their forecasts or prioritizations um, or um, get consumer research in a more accurate way to understand the beliefs and needs of their consumers, um, all of these applications can be used by um, subscribers to this software. Um, so really what we're focusing on is making humans smarter and having as broad a reach in terms of the teams and the applications that we um can help people make good decisions with as possible. Well, we'll link to that, uh, the artificial swarm intelligence paper in the show notes. And that one has a ton of uh, references by your yourself and Lewis and a variety of kind of peer reviewed conferences and journals and the like um, for folks that want to dig in deeper. Uh, but if you were to, is there any other, kind of singular reference that you would point folks to who want to learn more about uh, this way of kind of building systems or thinking about systems? Yeah, I think the white paper is the best resource for just understanding. Um, and other than that, I would refer you to our website, unanimous.ai, or our publications page, unanimous.ai slash publications. Those both are great resources for understanding how this works, the applications for where this can be applied, um, and sort of why it works. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Greg, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me. Really interesting stuff. Thank you, Sam, for having me. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on this guest or any of our guests, visit twimmelai.com. Be sure to register for TwimmelCon AI platforms today. You can do that at twimmelcon.com. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.